On today's episode, NASA reveals their secret to landing on Mars, Voyager 1 makes contact, Japan is taking another shot at landing on the moon, and China's lunar samples shed light on the far side. How do we land on Mars? The most successful landing procedures that we've seen so far involve either giant inflatable balls or this incredible sky crane operation, both of which are very cool, but neither of those are going to be practical for a human landing system on the red planet. NASA has been secretly learning how to land much bigger payloads on Mars, and they've been getting their intel from SpaceX, but not in the way that you might think. This one has nothing to do with Starship. Today's story comes from an article published in The Universe Today that features a very interesting interview with NASA's chief engineer on the Sky Crane landing system at their Jet Propulsion Laboratory. This is Robert Manning. He reveals something very interesting here, that as recently as 2007, NASA believed that a human landing on Mars might be genuinely impossible. Then, in September 2013, everything changed. The biggest problem that NASA identified was the thin atmosphere of Mars. This puts Mars somewhere between the Earth and the Moon in terms of landing procedure. And many would think that this means landing on Mars should be easy, since we've already landed on the Moon and the Earth. But that's not the case. On Mars, there is not enough atmosphere to land a vehicle the way that we do on Earth, using atmospheric drag. But it was believed by NASA that Mars actually had too much atmosphere to land the way that we do on the Moon, which is using propulsive technology alone. Why is that? Well, it has to do with something called the supersonic transition problem. Up until 10 years ago, it was widely believed that you had to slow a vehicle down to below the speed of sound before you could fire up retro propulsion, which is using the rocket's engine as a brake. There is no sound on the moon because there is next to no atmosphere, but there definitely is sound on Mars. And when coming into the Martian atmosphere from interstellar transit velocity, which for the most recent generation of Mars rover was about 20,000 kilometers per hour, it would be even faster for a crewed transport, which will also be considerably more massive than the one-ton rover payload. It would be physically impossible to slow down to below Mach 1 before smashing into the ground. NASA experimented with ideas for things like bigger parachutes or inflatable decelerators, but they couldn't find a reliable way to get the airspeed down to where the Jet Propulsion Laboratory traditionally knew how to fire their engines. Manning says this in the interview, quote, But there was one trick we didn't know anything about. How about using your propulsion system and firing the engines backwards, retro propulsion, while you were flying at supersonic speeds to shed velocity? Back in 2007, we didn't know the answer to that. We didn't even think it was possible. So what I find deeply fascinating is that one of the smartest people in NASA's smartest laboratory didn't think it would be possible to fire engines into an atmosphere at supersonic speed. Why is that though? Manning explains this, he says, When you fire engines backwards as you are moving through an atmosphere, there is a shock front that forms and it would be moving around, so it could come along and whack the vehicle and cause it to go unstable or cause damage. You're also flying right into the plume of the rocket engine exhaust, so there could be extra friction and heating possibilities on the vehicle. So it's not to say that they weren't curious to find out, it's just that there had never been a practical reason for them to try. NASA didn't have the funding to launch a vehicle into space just to watch it come down and see what happens, but Elon Musk did. In order for Falcon 9 to land in the ocean, the rocket needs to perform a re-entry burn. This slows the booster down in the supersonic phase, and at the altitude where the entry burn is performed, there's still a thin amount of Earth's atmosphere present that they're firing the engine directly into. Manning and the jet propulsion team immediately recognized that the Falcon 9 re-entry burn was the closest thing anyone had seen to the conditions of a propulsive Mars landing. What NASA learned from Falcon 9's supersonic retropropulsion was that they were wrong about everything. 
Beginning in 2014, NASA and SpaceX formed a three-year public-private partnership to study Falcon 9 called the NASA Propulsive Descent Technology Project. The SpaceX boosters were outfitted with special instruments to collect data specifically on portions of the entry burn which fell within the range of Mach numbers and dynamic pressures expected at Mars. Additionally, there were visual and infrared imagery campaigns, flight reconstructions, and fluid dynamics analysis, all of which helped both NASA and SpaceX to learn how to land on Mars. The biggest finding they made was that the shock front created by the engine firing, the thing they were worried might destroy the vehicle, that actually forms a protective bubble underneath the rocket that somehow insulates the spacecraft from any turbulence and heat. Based on that learning, NASA now believes that supersonic retropropulsion is the only way to land heavy equipment, habitats, and even humans on Mars. The next question that needs to be answered is just how much aerodynamic control a vehicle might have while moving at supersonic speed in the thin atmosphere of Mars. Basically, how do we steer a ship before that landing burn kicks in? And again, we're learning that in real time from SpaceX. When the Starship vehicle begins to re-enter Earth's atmosphere, it's flying at speeds over 20,000 kilometers per hour, and it's using its flaps to guide the vehicle. When Starship is flying at those altitudes of between 70 and 100 kilometers, they're essentially practicing for their Mars landing. And we know that NASA is again using this as an opportunity to learn. The next flight of Starship will go back to nighttime re-entry and landing. And one of the big reasons for that is because NASA wants to track the Starship as it descends using a thermal imaging camera mounted to a jet airplane. Just like with Falcon 9, it's the first opportunity we've ever had to experiment with something like this. So we're learning a lot right now about landing on Mars without even having to leave the Earth. Moving out way beyond Mars and into deep space beyond the solar system, NASA has reconnected with an old friend. Voyager 1 is alive and well, and communications with the probe have just been restored after a blackout that began in October. Now at 47 years old, Voyager 1 is 25 billion kilometers away from the Earth. With the power supply from its decaying plutonium running low, only four of its instruments remain operational, and all of them are working at temperatures lower than they were originally designed for. So when engineers commanded Voyager 1 to switch on one of its heaters to give the instruments a warm-up, a safety feature was tripped because of the low power levels. The spacecraft's fault protection system automatically switches off non-essential systems when energy levels fall too low. But the problem was that all of the non-essential systems had already been shut down a long time ago, so the fault protection system took it on itself to turn off the main X-band transmitter and activate the lower powered S-band transmitter instead. But, because Voyager 1 is so far away, transmissions on the S-band antenna couldn't be heard by NASA's deep space network, meaning that Voyager 1 had effectively fallen silent. So things were a bit scary there until NASA was able to restart the X-band communication in late November. Now the spacecraft is once again returning data from its four remaining instruments. The Low Energy Charge Particle Experiment, the Cosmic Ray Telescope, the Triaxial Fluxgate Magnetometer, and the Plasma Waves Experiment. NASA is still optimistic that both probes will hang on long enough to celebrate their 50th anniversary. Japan is taking another shot at landing on the moon in January 2025. Their resilience lander from private company iSpace has arrived at Cape Canaveral, Florida for integration into a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. This is lunar mission number two for iSpace, following the company's first attempt to land on the moon in April 2023. That mission ended in failure after an altitude sensor was confused by the rim of a large crater, leaving the spacecraft to act as if it were closer to the lunar surface than it actually was. The new lander, which is based on the same Hakuto-R platform as the previous one but with a software upgrade, was transported by a commercial cargo plane from Japan to Florida. The Resilience Lander will also carry a small rover named Tenacious, developed by iSpace in addition to commercial and scientific payloads. The mission is expected to contribute to the NASA-led Artemis program. 
Speaking of the moon, China has begun to analyze samples collected by the recent Chang'e 6 mission to the lunar far side, and they've already revealed some new insights into our moon's volcanic history. According to a new study published in November, we can now say that volcanoes were actively erupting on the far side of the moon as recently as 2.8 billion years ago. This is interesting because there is significantly less evidence of volcanism on the far side than there is on the near side. The dark regions of the moon that we all know so well are not nearly as present on the moon's opposite hemisphere. We're still not sure why that is. It's been one of the things that researchers are trying to figure out with the new rock samples that have been collected by China. What we've found in the hardened lava from the far side is a much lower presence of potassium, rare earth elements, and phosphorus than what has been seen before in near side samples. So not only is there an imbalance in the amount of volcanic activity between the two sides, there is also a big difference in the composition of the rock. The theory right now is that this might have something to do with the massive impact crater that became the moon's South Pole Aiken Basin.